Hey folks, welcome to the 16th episode of the Dialogue Project with Aditya Bhatia, Akash Janakar and Vere Devya. Today we have with us Karan Javeri, who has recently completed his Master's in Mechanical Engineering from University of California, Berkeley, with specialization in Advanced Energy Technology. He has previously done his Bachelor's in Mechanical Engineering from BML Manjal University in India. So welcome, Karan. It is a pleasure having you with us today. Yeah, it's great being here too. Thank you for inviting me. Hi, Karan. So let's start with our discussion. Uh, to begin with, let's understand your uh, profile in terms of three aspects. Uh, A, your academic uh, uh, background. B, is your uh, work experience or, or internships. And C, is uh, extracurricular activities you must have done in the past. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, I'm assuming this is in terms of uh, applying for my master's. And uh, I think this was mostly uh, academic. So uh, my master's was in mechanical engineering while I was applying as well. So I wanted to focus more on my undergrad in mechanical engineering. So what I did uh, during my undergrad was uh, a general mechanical engineering degree, but I tried to focus my subjects towards something that I wanted to do, which was renewable energy. Uh, and so uh, my undergrad was, uh, I wouldn't say it was the best I could have done, but uh, I still had a GPA of 9.2. Uh, so I think that also helps generally uh, a good GPA uh, would help uh, because if, when it converts to the US GPA, anything around nine uh, goes up to a really high on the four scale. So uh, I think that's helpful. Apart from that, extracurriculars, I would say I was uh, part of the debate team at my undergrad university. Um, I was also doing a lot of different stuff, but uh, nothing worth mentioning in my master's application. So I think the primary thing that I mentioned was uh, the debate team that I was a part of. Uh, some uh, social work that I was doing uh, was also part of my uh, resume, but I didn't really emphasize on that. But some of the things that I did was uh, debate and some social work as part of a nearby school uh, at my university. Uh, internships, I did uh, a lot of internships because I wanted to understand what I wanted to do in life. So I, I started out uh, interning at an electric vehicle manufacturing plant. Uh, which is more of an industrial engineering kind of a role, uh, uh, slowly graduated towards um, uh, electric vehicles as well in general. Uh, so I interned at Tata towards the end of my, uh, Tata Technologies towards the end of my bachelor's. And uh, before that, I interned with a company called Batex Energies, which was a startup incubated at my undergrad university. Uh, this was dealing with recycling and manufacturing of batteries for um, two-wheelers and three-wheelers in India. Uh, and a couple of other internships here and there uh, during the lockdown, which I found online. So that was mostly dealing with mechanical design or um, some uh, technologies that I was working on, uh, which weren't a really massive part of my application. So I tried to include those parts of my uh, undergrad uh, experience, uh, curriculars, as well, extracurriculars, as well as my academics that directly inclined with the program that I was applying to. So this was, uh, I guess, a good uh, introduction to my background. Got it, got it, got it. So now if you move on to the uh, test score part of the application, uh, which tests are accepted uh, for an MS at UC Berkeley? Uh, which ones did you give and what were your uh, scores on them? Sure. Uh, so I think the one that they, the only one that they considered was the TOEFL. Uh, my score on that was 114 on 120. Um, the division was... Uh, 30 on the, uh, I think, reading, and then 28 on the other three. So uh, I think the reading was the best one. And then uh, the test score, the test that I also gave was the GRE. Uh, and I had uh, 170 on the quant and 160 on the verbal, which gives a total of 330 uh, out of the 340. Uh, so um, speaking about what was considered, uh, a lot of mechanical engineering programs in the US last year did not except uh, uh, GRE scores. So they were either optional or not accepted at all. So uh, colleges like MIT, Stanford, uh, Caltech, these universities did not accept uh, GRE scores at all. The, and this is only for mechanical engineering. I'm pretty sure CS and other uh, programs accepted GRE. But for mechanical engineering, for some reason, they have stopped accepting the GRE, including UC Berkeley. They did not accept my GRE score. Oh. Okay. Okay. And um, 
And so what was your personal preference in terms of uh, hiring an admissions consultant for your application journey or entering the services of a uh, GRE or TOEFL test prep service? So I just went around to a few places in Mumbai and Delhi and saw uh, what kind of environment they had and what kind of teachers they had. And I just went with the one that felt the best. So I personally went with the IMS uh, GRE help. Uh, so mostly dealing with like the textbooks that they had and then attending some of the tests that they were able to provide. So these were practice tests and um, there, there were some tests that were a, that were able to tell me how much I would score on the final test as well. So I think these are called like, um, I don't remember what they're called, but these tests help you understand what level you are at right now, basically. And so um, I think the best choice to go with uh, a GRE or TOEFL test prep is to see what kind of books they have. And, and what kind of practice they can give you. Because GRE is not about what you know. It's more about the practice that you do. Uh, in terms of admissions consulting, I wanted to uh, get someone who could you know, personalize my application. I'd heard from everyone right since my first year that, oh, you have these three uh, REACH universities and three, uh, uh, I don't know, dream universities and three, uh, the ones that you'll definitely get. Uh, something like that. And so you divide your applications in that way. But uh, for me personally, um, so I, I did not, I knew that I had to take a loan in order to go ahead with my, uh, you know, masters. I couldn't afford it myself. And I wanted to make sure that the university was something that, uh, I mean, if I was to invest the same amount of money and the same amount of time, I would rather go for a university that was better. Uh, and, and if I don't get in, I would rather not go rather than, you know, go for something that was uh, not something that was a good match. And so uh, I wanted someone who could do it in this personalized way. I definitely went ahead with a counselor first who uh, gave me this idea of three, three and three uh, and divided it in, the, in that sense. But um, I, I wasn't really satisfied with that because I, I didn't want to go ahead, as I said, with such a procedure. And so I, I, Took up, uh, took it up myself at first. Uh, I researched universities, and I know it's really hard to do that. But I think uh, doing it with a counselor who does this three, three, and three also helps because they at least tell you the three dream universities that you could target for uh, based on your profile. And so I think I used those and added a bit uh, of my own. And I also had an idea from my professors who, uh, who were guiding me as well. So most of my application was done by myself and uh, a few of my friends, uh, rather than going for a, uh, you know, complete package of counseling from someone. Um, I used help for editing my SOPs, LORs and all of that, uh, from, uh, an editor who was, uh, previously also a part of such an organization who did these three, three and three, but now they, uh, moved on and opened their own counseling services. Um, and, and so I used their help for uh, editing uh, all of my documents. Uh, one of my major helps was one of my friends who is also who had also received an admit from the US uh, at Columbia University, who was also a part of one of your video series, Manan Thakkar. He was a big help in, um, uh, you know, helping me frame my sentences and um, put a lot of things together for my application. So I would say the best resource you would have is your friends and family uh, who either have gone through this process before or at least understand you better in terms of your, uh, you know, you've always heard how applications should be very uh, specific to you and not very generic. And so your family and friends are the only ones who can help you uh, uh, see uh, how this is turning out rather than someone who is a third person who has never talk to you before right so that was my thought process when i went for uh, this application and so what was the name of the admissions consultant uh, from which you took sure. like a bit of help uh, her name is uh, ratna pant uh, i can share her number with you as well or contact details sure. email id everything like that um, and and they're really uh, good at uh, at least editing and uh, they've sent a lot of students already um, uh, to good universities. So I think that they can be really helpful. Great, great. Understood. Uh, so now moving on to the uh, application process uh, of UC Berkeley, what were the uh, stages involved in the process? Sure. Um, firstly, uh, you have your application, which has SOP, LORs, um, your 
TOEFL score at least. Um, let's see. And, and so all of these processes are usually very generic. Like everyone has a similar process. Someone would have a few extra things. Someone would have a few things that are not present in there. Berkeley had also um, this process where you had to convert your undergrad GPA in a foreign country to uh, the US GPA. So they had this whole um, conversion system in, in on their website that you had to put into Excel and, and, and show basically what your uh, uh, US GPA looks like. Uh, other than that, uh, so this was the application before I submitted it. Uh, SOP, LOR, and the scores and GPA and undergrad. Uh, the next stage of this process was to have this interview, which is not really a very uh, formal interview. It was more of uh, an understanding of culture. So Berkeley really wants to understand what kind of a culture or what kind of a, a difference you can bring into the cohort that you're entering. Got it, got it, got it. Understood. Uh, so moving on, Karan, uh, what are the internships and uh, internships or part-time jobs available at UC Berkeley uh, for students like yourself? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, I mean, in terms of internships, you usually do them during the summer break, uh, right? And so there are tons of internships available every uh, summer. Uh, you'll have uh, any company that you want will have internship programs. And they'll especially come at Berkeley as well to, to see what kind of students are interested in their internship program. So, um, yeah, internships are very readily available. Uh, during the year, you'll also have uh, jobs that you can do, part-time jobs, as you said, uh, which include uh, either a TA, which at Berkeley is called a GSI, and an RA, which is uh, called a GSR. So this is the graduate student instructor and the graduate student researcher. And I think this is common for uh, the UC system in general. So UC LA, UC Irvine, all of these will have the same nomenclature. And uh, so, so yeah, right. So for part time, mostly on campus or in the university, you'll have GSI, GSR, and these are only for graduate students, right? Not for uh, the, it is also for undergrads. They're called the UGSIs. So that that is also available. Um, you can also do a reader position, which is kind of uh, just trying to, or, or, or just reading assignments and grading them, uh, reading or grading assignments, grading uh, midterms, grading finals and all of that. Um, other than this, uh, you'll have part-time jobs that you can do uh, just in general, say at cafes or, or uh, restaurants. Or, but I mean, definitely uh, something that you can do uh, as an undergrad, as a master's student, usually you would not prefer to do that because you don't have too much time. Uh, right, you just have either one, one and a half, two years to do your masters, and um, these are, uh, let's say, uh, minimal pay jobs, right? Because you're working as a waiter or a, uh, you know, sweeper or something like that, or you're washing vessels or something like that. So as an undergrad, it's good money. Uh, as a grad student, time is a bit more valuable when you don't have too much time. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think I saw a lot of grad students doing that. Uh, but definitely available uh, everywhere. Uh, depending on the type of visa you have, uh, you can surely work part time. Understood. And did you go for anything specifically? Right. So I did a GSI appointment during the second semester, uh, which was this last spring semester. Uh, I was teaching Physics 7B, which is the thermodynamics and electromagnetism uh, class. Uh, uh, for undergrads. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, so, Karan, coming uh, to the next question. Uh, so, the part of the application, which is not very clear to most applicants, uh, I think, uh, because it is slightly subjective, is the SOP of the LORs. Uh, so, uh, could you share some of your SOP and LOR tips with our viewers? Sure. I think uh, one is uh, just make your SOP uh, like there's no limit. Uh, start with that. This was a recommendation given to me by someone else as well. And I really found it to be, sorry, uh, really found it to be helpful. Uh, like just start with making a story for why exactly you want to do this program and why you're good for it. Uh, maybe start from anything you want. Start from fifth grade, sixth grade, make a story and then slowly start 
uh, you know, shortening it because I know shortening it is really hard to do, especially when there's hard limits like 500 words or 1000 words. Uh, but this process really helps you lay down all your cards and see uh, what you can use, like anything at all. So maybe uh, so a good point of research could be I, I felt that once I got into the university, I knew a whole lot of things that I could have used for my application. Uh, right. And so like names of professors, names of research labs. And this is not something that you can find easily online. So what a, a good piece of advice could be talk to someone at the university as to what all is available there, what could be a good fit for you. You know, there are a lot of clubs, there are a lot of activities going on on campus that are not very easily available online until you're there, you know. So uh, all of these really help. Uh, use very specific personalized um, sentences, personalized SOPs. LORs is something different depending on how you're going ahead with it. Most of my LORs came directly from the professors, but I know some of the people, you know, tend to send the LOR uh, to the student and, and see what kind of suggestions they have. And so this is also something that you can do. But I think even there, if you get this opportunity to uh, do the LOR yourself or at least suggest some things to the professor, what you can do is the things that you had extra in the SOP, you remove that, put it into your LOR somehow uh, and, and make it as an experience with the professor. Right. So say you had a research project or a project that you really want to mention, but don't have space on your SOP. Put that in your LOR if you have the chance and, and uh, let the professor talk about the project that you did with him. Um, so, I mean, overall, I think it's a whole package that you send over anyway, right? So they read everything. And uh, although they skim past it, uh, it definitely makes a difference if there's multiple things that stand out. So, yeah, these are a few tips. Definitely helps. Understood. One very specific point which you mentioned, which I find very useful is using your SOP to prepare your LORs, mm -hmm. uh, which is very useful, I think. Hey folks, thank you for watching our video. Please like and share this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also guys, please don't forget to mention your views in the comment section below and see you soon with our next video.